hello and uh, thanks for starting coming over for the hydration lecture series. Uh, today, uh, I'm, I have the honor to have uh, Dr. Hugh Butler, Tamara Hugh Butler uh, from uh, Oakland University uh, from Rochester, Michigan. And uh, I would like to tell you a couple things about uh, Dr. Hugh Butler. Uh, she did her undergrad in, uh, from UCLA and she has a doctor degree from podiatric medicine from Temple University. Uh, she did her PhD uh, in University of Cape Town in South Africa uh, with Professor Noakes. Uh, she's a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine and she specialized both in the area of sports medicine and exercise science. And it's my pleasure to have you here. Thanks for the invitation and uh, thanks for uh, logging in online for the online viewers and thank you for coming here in this room. I want to thank Dr. Kloris for allowing me to talk about my absolutely favorite topic in the whole world, exercise-associated hyponatremia. So exercise-associated hyponatremia is going to be abbreviated as EAH, and I'm going to talk about the role of arginine vasopressin, which is the body's antidiuretic hormone, which I will use as ABP. And I'm happy to be here in the land of the hog. And be here in this really, really beautiful day. Uh, when I came here, it was um, from Michigan, it was minus 10. So I have no financial relationship to report, but I want to preface my talk of where I'm coming from. So I'm going to come to you talking about hyponatremia from a clinical perspective. This clinical per per perspective goes all the way back to the first death from hyponatremia, which was in 1935. And in 1935, they did surgery on a 50-year-old woman, and instead of giving her IV, they were giving her one liter boluses through the rectum to try to keep her hydrated. They gave her a little bit too much, and she ended up dying. So I followed the clinical literature quite a bit and how the medical community classified hyponatremia. I'm also uh, very interested in the animal literature, what animals get hyponatremia naturally, which is long-distance horses as well as sled dogs. You know, rats and sheep that are studied are very interesting because they don't have like the uh, marketing, they don't have the influence of the advice of other people. So you get to see how they react. There's a little bit of an element of the basic science that fits into hydration that my background is gonna come to you as well, which deals with small uh, aquaporin channels, maybe some beta present two receptors, so when I present to you the exercise literature, this is the background that I'm coming from. Okay, so man has been able to be superior and succeed because we can control our environment. We can take hostile environments and then make them to fit so they're livable conditions. So when we had times that we didn't have everything available to us, which is how we evolve, this goes back to exercise. So when we exercise and we sweat and we needed to have water, we actually had to find it. We had to go to the pond, we had to go to the fire hydrant. And if we actually uh, drink a little bit too much, there are the consequences of we needed to find a place to pee. So now we really don't have that anymore. If you go to most races, and my bent is uh, marathon races, there's water everywhere. There's so much water in athletic events. You look at that and go, gee, there's water there. Maybe I should drink. And this is the land that we live in now. The same thing to me goes with food. There was times where nature was cruel. We didn't have a lot. We had to prepare for times where we didn't have a lot of food. They were lean times. And then again, to uh, be prepared when there was times of plenty. So coming from Michigan, there's always times of plenty, and you can see the animals just like fatten up to prepare for these really, really lean times where there's not a lot of food. Well, now in this environment, there is food everywhere. There is hardly a place in all well, there exists in the world. There's just food everywhere. There's so many choices. But, you know, we never have to worry about being scarce anymore because there is so many options available. And that's where I'm going to come from you. So the question that I posed in this lecture is, is arginine vasopressin a pathogenic factor in the development of exercise-associated hyponatremia? Is ADP the good guy or is ADP the bad guy? That's the question I'm going to pose and hope to answer. 
And how I hope to answer that today is saying that all mammals and non-mammals, locusts, worms, toads, fishes, we're all physiologically programmed for scarcity. That's how we have evolved. So there's all these redundant mechanisms, including water conservation, that have prepared us for these lean times. I want to argue that it's our behavior and our environment that is pathological and not the response of our new invasive presence. So my talk's going to go in these uh, big terms. We're going to go over a few confusing terminology, words that I think are confusing to our field. Uh, then I'm going to give you a brief overview of exercise-associated hyponatremia, a brief overview of arginine vasopressin, and then close by seeing how arginine vasopressin mediates exercise-associated hyponatremia. So on to confusing words. This is a big confusing word, uh, particularly amongst exercise scientists, in relationship to hyponatremia. It's the word inappropriate. What is inappropriate? Well. And when we think of something being appropriate or inappropriate, we need to think about the context in which it relates to. So in terms of AVP, there's a syndrome called SID, SIADH, which is the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. And this was, again, described uh, by, in 1957 by Schwartz and Barter, and that criteria takes hold today. And so when they use the term inappropriate, that is in the context of osmolality. And osmolality is the amount of solutes in the blood, which is, I use them interchangeably with sodium because sodium makes up a majority of the extracellular fluid around that goes around your blood. So what osmolality is, it's really twice the sodium plus uh, glucose and urea, which is plus 10. So when I talk about osmolality and sodium, I'm using them interchangeably. They're not the same, but but anyway, so when they say AVP is inappropriate, it's in relationship to the amount of sodium or solute in the blood. If the concentration of sodium gets too high, you want to retain water, right? You don't want to look the water to go out because that will concentrate it even more. So when they say AVP is inappropriate, they say it's inappropriate re with regards to the amount of sodium or osmolites within the blood. However, in the context of exercise, AVP may be appropriate. AVP is appropriate when there's um, volume depletion. So when there's a lack of water circulating through your blood, again, you want water to be retained. So it's an appropriate stimulus there. Uh, AVP is also stimulated when you're vomiting or when you're nauseous. And you think about that, you're like expelling all this fluid. You want your body to retain whatever fluid that it has. So in the context of maybe exercise, hypovolemia, or even nausea and vomiting, AVP is appropriate. So think about the context. This one word has probably caused most of the confusion when we talk about, you know, between labs, you know, the competition. What is dehydration? It's this. You're wrong. I'm right. So what do we mean by dehydration? For the most part, we think about it's an imbalance. And I think this is where the problem comes in, where we don't agree. Not that we're wrong or we're right, but what are we referring to? So most of the time, I think in exercise, we refer to dehydration as any loss of body weight from when you start exercise to when you finish exercise. But that's not the same if you come into a lab, you do cycle for two hours, and you measure your body weight. That's different for like when I test people who start marathons or triathlete. When you do a marathon triathlete, you carbo load, you don't exercise, you retain a lot of food, you retain some water. So if you're taking body weight from the start of a marathon or triathlon, and then taking the end body weight, that's a little bit different. I'm not sure if that's all dehydration. But again, too, what are we talking about when we say, oh, that subject is dehydration? Then we think, okay, are we talking about total body water that's lost? But then if you're thinking about, okay, the 60% of water that's lost, is that water that's lost from our body an isotonic loss, meaning the water that is lost, is, is it the same concentration of sodium, or is it mainly a loss of uh, water from the volemic space, from your circulating volume, or is this water lost mainly from the cells? 
or cellular desiccation. So again, too, where I'm going to come from in terms of dehydration is from the clinical definition. And this clinical definition you can find in some of these articles, McGee and JAMA, uh, Mange, in Annals of Internal Medicine, if you want more. When I think about dehydration, I go to the clinical definition, which is the loss of intracellular water that ultimately causes cellular desiccation and elevates the plasma sodium and osmolality. So in clinical, the loss of water makes the water come out of the cells and the cells to like shrivel up into raisins. They, they consider a loss of water with this result as dehydration, which is different from volume depletion. And volume depletion, which is the volume within your circulation and that gets smaller, is defined clinically as a loss of sodium from the, in, excuse me, the extracellular space. Because sodium is actually what expands your plasma volume, and or if you lose that, it contracts your plasma volume. So those are the differences that I would like to uh, clarify right off the bat. And again, too, if we think about how much water do we have in our body, it's about 60% of our body weight. Again, too, just as a review, two-thirds of the water that's within our body is inside of the cells, while a third of it is outside of the cells. And even, too, the water that's outside of the cells includes the water that's in the circulating space of the plasma volume. But that's only 10% of our total body water. The amount that's circulating through our, our, our arterioles and our venous system, that's 10%. So water can move from these other spaces to keep tissue perfusion going. And that's really, really important because if the clinical literature says, what does the body protect? What does the body defend during exercise or, or at rest? It defends tissue perfusion and then tonicity. And again, if you think about it, you need the circulation because you need to get the oxygen to, to the tissues. You need to deliver the nutrients. You need to remove the waste product. So that's the priority of your body. And then to maintain the tonicity, which maintains cell size, then secondarily that is defended. So what is exercise-associated hyponatremia? Hyponatremia is a biochemical definition. It's defined as a serum or plasma sodium concentration that is below the normal reference range of the laboratory performing the task. So all the seen here should have a sodium, serum sodium value between 135 and 145. And that's a pretty narrow range of regulation if you think about it. If your blood sodium concentration is below 135, that is hyponatremia, low blood sodium. If it's above 145, the biochemical definition is hypernatremia, high blood sodium. You can die at other every other extreme. So what? So again, sodium is the main ion that is outside of the cell. Potassium is the main ion that's inside of the cell. Sodium and potassium really don't freely move past the cell membrane, but water moves across the cell membrane. And it moves from areas of lower concentration to higher concentration. So if there's more sodium in the blood, hypernatremia, the water is going to flow from inside of the cell to outside of the cell to try to maintain what we call tonicity. Contrarily, if there is less sodium outside of the cell than there's potassium inside of the cell. Water is going to flow from outside of the cell to inside of the cell. So what does that mean? I like pictures, obviously. So normatremia is when your sodium is between 135 and 145, which you should be here. This is like the, the, the size that your cells like, like to be in and they function best. So if you have high blood salt, hypernatremia, the water is going to flow from inside of the cell to outside of the cell, and all of your cells are going to shrink. And again, people can die from this when actually when your brain the cell shrinks so much and so fast, it actually pulls the meninges off, and that's how people die. Hyponatremia, again, the water flows from outside of the cell to inside of the cell so that all the cells swell. And we see this in nature everywhere. Again, too, we see this in my tomato plants. You know, if you put salt on the snail, it's all the cells are going to desiccate and it's going to die. And again, too, with hyponatremia, the cells will start to expand and sometimes they can burst. So where in your body is 
cell swelling going to be a big problem. It's going to be a big problem in your lungs and particularly in your brain. So if you look at the right-hand side, that's a normal chest x-ray, and that's a normal TT scan of a brain. If you look on the left end, that's a hyponatremic patient with water on the lungs, pulmonary edema, as well as water swelling within the brain. How people die from hyponatremia is the brain swells so much, the skull is there so it can't swell anymore, so it actually pushes the brain stem out. It pushes your brain cell out, and that's how people die from hyponatremia. Now, this is also new data. I know there's some muscle people here from the lab. We think that actually if the cells swell and you get hyponatremia during the race, what happens when you fill a water balloon too much? Is it more likely going to break, or is it less likely to break? More likely, right? You're making it bigger. The cell wall is going to be thinner. It's more likely to break. So... In these ultra-marathon races, we saw these case clusters of people in the hospital with hypernatremia and rhabdomyolysis. And we thought, huh, what kind of came first? It makes sense that people who had rhabdo, if you clog the kidneys up, you can't excrete into the water, you get dilution, right? But there's some uh, instances where people who drink too much compulsively, psychogenic poly uh, polydipsics, they drink so much, they actually, if their swells break, they actually had spontaneous rhabdo. So we thought, gee, what comes first in exercise? So this was actually a, a, a ultra marathon race. Uh, we just submitted this for, for publication in Australia. So if you look on the x-axis, this is blood that was taken at different points, 53 kilometers, 104, um, 174, and then 24 hours post. We were, and on the y-axis is the blood sodium concentration. And again, too, we know that if your blood concentration is below 135, that is considered hyponatremic. So we were lucky enough in this race that 10 out of 15 were hyponatremic. That's 66% of the field uh, at any one point in the race. So we actually were able to characterize the people into the orange, which had sodiums that were low, below 130. We call that moderate hyponatremia. And then in the yellow, which we call that mild hyponatremia, that was a sodium between 130 and 134 at any time. And then the green triangles that they never got hyponatremia ever at the race. So you can see in the orange, there were two people who got in sodiums in the 120s at that second, second distance point right here. So we said, okay, we want to know which came first. Well, this is a CPK, which is the, the it shows the amount, amount of the cell, muscle cell breakage. The more cells that break, the more CPK that is liberated into the system. Where do you see the peaks in CPK? Right after you saw the hyponatremia. So we thought, oh man, so maybe the hyponatremia during exercise and you're still running will make these muscle cells fragile so that they will break more when you exercise. And again, too, looking at this, we found that this relationship appeared to be dose dependent. Those with the most severe hyponatremia had the highest CPK values than the people who had mild hyponatremia and then the people who never had hypernutrient at all. So we think that muscle cells are affected by hypernutrient as well. So how many people like get hypernutrient in sports? We do, there's a lot of like convenient samples where we go out and we test a lot of people after sports, after races, and these are the maximum incidents that we had found. So in marathon runners, we found probably uh, some of the highest reports are 13%. Ultra marathon runners, we've seen it at 50%. And again, too, with uh, Ross's study in Australia, we sat at any one point, that was 66%. That's a lot. Uh, the greatest incident we saw on cyclists has been 12%. Ironman triathlons, about a third of anyone who came to the finish line. Hikers, we saw an incident of 16%. And again, too, we call that asymptomatic. They were never treated in the medical tent. We only did, we were only able to, to diagnose it because they were in our study. So we're still not sure if this is bad or if it's good, but it happens. In terms of like who gets really, really sick, who gets pulmonary edema, who gets encephalopathy, who might die. Clinically significant hypernatremia at the end of a race has been estimated to be about 14 in 1,000 persons or 0 0.02 per 1,000 uh, persons, including the military. So it's not a large people, uh, amount of people who get really sick from hypernatremia, but it's entirely preventable. So how many people have died from hypernatremia? Five in the mar marathon, four in the military, three in football. So actually two high school football players just died of hypernatremia. 
Uh, and I'll talk about that at the end. So we're convening an, another conference, which is bad. One cyclist, one hiker, and one canoeist all have died. But again, it doesn't sound like a lot. It doesn't sound like diabetes or obesity, but it's entirely preventable. These are healthy people who maybe drink a little bit too much, and they drink them close to death. So how do you get hyponatremia? Basically, we're like two sides of the fence. If you think about your concentration of salt in water, so I'm going to think in a very simplistic way, if you have three rocks in 100 milliliters of water, if you add more water, you're going to dilute the salt. You're going to dilute so that you can dilute the, the rock so that you have fluid retention. On the other side of the coin, if I take away the rocks, I can take the sodium away and also get hyponatremia. And we battled for years of like, is it water retention or is it salt depletion? But now, with all the literature that's coming out, it's probably most of it's in between. There's not a lot or hardly any at the extremes. Most of hyponatremia is probably a combination of the two entities. So again, we know that our body is in balance. Generally, the water that we take in, if we don't need it, we pee it out. The sodium that we take in, we become uh, get get into a balance too, so that if we take 24-hour urines, we can actually predict what, how much sodium a person takes in because the sodium that takes in, once you reach homeostasis, is the sodium takes out. So again, too, and then we achieve this normal balance, 130 to 145 sodium. So again, we know that if you take in too much fluid above the capacity of your body to excrete it, you can get dilutional hyponatremia. If you lose salt, more salt in your body stores than you've taken in, particularly in a longer, hotter race, we can get not complete sodium depletion. You don't lose all the sodium out of your body. We get volume depletion. You lose some of the salt, it actually contracts the amount of blood that's going to be circulating through our circulation. So. When we talk about water and sodium balance, it gets dicey so that sometimes, again, if it's a longer duration of exercise, it gets hotter. So if you go out, you're not acclimatized today. I started out at 8 o'clock this morning. It was like 30 degrees, but you're still exercising throughout the rest of the day. It's probably going to be in the 60s. The longer, the hotter, the more sweat, maybe the more sodium that you lose. What happens is if you train yourself, okay, I know how much water I need to drink because I did the you know, I ran for an hour and I know how much weight I drink, so this is how much water I should take in. Well, if you're losing more salt, that balance has to shift so you, that you take in actually less water to keep your sodium at the normal balance point. And again, too, if you're generally able to, like, excrete any water that is, that's in excess of what you take in, if that goes away, you get nauseous, you get start to vomit, something stresses you out, it gets really really hot, then again, you can't take in that much water to keep your sodium in that balance between 135 and 145. So again, too, when you think of real life competitive event, you're out there practicing, uh, you're out in a competition, oh, a lot of things you're not going to control and you don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how much we're going to spree, if AP is going to be high then it gets really, really confusing after that. And then we have to think about, okay, well, then how much sodium do we maybe need to take in to be able to bring that back into normal? It's very, very hard to predict. So, again, when the guidelines for fluid intake came out, there, I think, I don't know, it must have been about 10 years ago, it was like, we need to maintain our body weight. And what did I tell you that the body tries to protect? The body tries to protect tissue perfusion, and tonicity. It doesn't really protect body weight. So when we actually try to use body weight as the surrogate of like how much salt and water we need to take in, I think we really start to confuse our body. We, you know, we don't know when AP is going to be high, when it's going to be low, it's going to be high, you're going to slow down, you're going to speed up. These are the things that happen in a race that makes things a lot more confusing. So it's like the weather. You can maybe predict for a little bit of time, but the longer and the harder that it goes, it becomes more difficult. If you try to maintain body weight, that's not what your body defends. And so you will actually start to fight your body. Again, because your body wants to protect tissue perfusion and then tonicity.
especially when you do exercise. So, arginine vein depressant is a hormone. The active, bioactive um, portion of AVP is nine amino acids. It's a monopeptide with a disulfide bond. So it's itty bitty, it's small. It's measured in picograms per ml. Anybody know, what's a picogram? Student? Yes, and what is that? It's the trillions. This is measured in your blood in trillions, trillions of a gram. That's little. The half-life of AVP, nine amino acids, is like 10 to 20 minutes. So when we measure it, we have to like, we, you know, we have to draw it, we got to spin it, we got to freeze it, because it's gone. So something so small that goes away so fast is very difficult to measure. And again, too, because it's, because it's difficult to measure, it's very, very sensitive. So we will talk about the classic um, actions of arginine vasopressin in terms of like antidiuretic hormone and keeping water in your body. But know that all hormones are just basically chemical signals. And ADP does a lot of things into the body. It is, you know, it's a neurotransmitter. It has behavior, cognition, it affects your circadian rhythm. So again, just know that the hormone does a lot of different things, but we're actually going to look at just the major thing that that it's supposed to do. So, arginine vasopressin is the main antidiuretic hormone. It is stimulated when the body needs to protect water. You don't want to get rid of any water again. So again, too, there's, in simplistic terms, there's two receptors. The V2 receptor, what happens if there's too much solute, too much sodium in your blood? You don't want to lose any more water and make it worse. So that's the stimulus. Hypernatremia, hyperosmolality will make water be retained through your kidney, the collecting duct, so you don't lose any more. When you lose, when you become hypovolemic, when your plasma volume gets lower, there's less water circulating through your system. This actually affects the pressure sensors uh, in your carotid sinus, other places in your body that say, hey, I don't have as much blood circulating. I need to conserve water, right? That's through the V1 receptor. V1 receptor also stimulates the AVP and then also causes the vessels to contract. So in a normal regulatory sense, the relationship between AVP on the y-axis is linear with the change in osmolality. So for any increase in osmolality, any increase in natremia, hypernatremia, there's a proportional increase in AVP. So the higher osmolality, the more hypernatremic, the higher the AVP. This relationship between blood pressure and volume is not as much, only becomes linear once you lose past about 10% of your blood volume. Within, after about 10% of blood volume loss, you'll start to stimulate AVP in a linear fashion. And these two coordinate, these two systems between blood volume and osmolality actually are related to each other. So if you have less circulating blood volume, right here, if you have a reduction in blood volume, this will actually increase the gain. So it has just a little bit of a change in plasma osmolality will cause a greater re increase in ABP. But if your plasma volume is expanded, this gain will be decreased, where it will take a greater increase in plasma osmolality or hypernatremia to cause a smaller response in ADP. So they are related. So this is a graph from uh, Joe Verbalis. Uh, he presented this 10 years ago. It's complicated, but it's it's really, really important. So if you look here, this, we're looking here on the bottom, on the, the x-axis at urine volume. And then here, we're looking at the amount of stuff within the urine or the urine concentration. And as you notice, AVP between 0 and 1 picograms per ml. Again, very tiny to the trillion. This is so sensitive. Right in this area here will make a big difference in the amount of urine or extra water that you can excrete. So even if you're right here at almost zero, you can excrete maybe a liter 
of water through your urine. If you take in a liter of water and you don't need any of it, you can excrete that urine. But even if you, if ABP is elevated just 0.5, if you take in a liter of water, you can only excrete half a liter maximum. You need to retain that. If your ABP in your blood is one picogram per ml, you can only excrete 250 ml. So if you're taking in a liter, 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 and something, you get stressed out, you get a little bit nauseated, you get above one, your ability to excrete 1,000 liters that you've taken in versus 250 liters, it's a big difference. So with this, this the take home point is ABP, this system is so sensitive to all the changes that are going on in your body in real time. And again, two people say, oh, when you get thirsty, it's too late. Well, if you think about the normal range which thirst is stimulated and your normal range of sodium, which is, this is really uh, around 135 to 145 sodium, it's within, it's not too late. It's within your normal th thirst threshold. So again, to ABP, this little hormone, it is synthesized in these two nuclei within your brain. It's synthesized, it travels down the infundibular stalk, and it's stored as little granules within the posterior pituitary. And only when there's a stimulus, where it's high plasma osmolality or low blood volume, this stimulus will cause the posterior uh, pituitary to release these granules of ADP into the circulation. Now, in real time, you're always, as the blood's going through, how does the, how does the body uh, detect your osmolality and your amount of pressure. Well, these are, there are these afferent input to your brain. There is osmoreceptor input. There's these places within your brain called circumventricular organs that don't have a blood brain barrier. So they're always going to be um, access to the circulating amount of blood sodium that's going on in real time. And then from the Pressure receptors, you're also constantly going to get input in real time of the changes in your, your vascular pressure, your plasma volume change. Is it contracting? Is it expanding? In real time, you're always going to get these going through. So get to, you know, we've got these calculators. How much fluid am I going to drink? And I'm going to exercise this speed and this temperature and this, this, that. And you can kind of calculate an estimation of the needs. But I argue here, you've got these two subfornical organs or the OVLT if you want to impress your family. Again, these are the organs that are that are in your brain, don't have a blood brain barrier, that sees constantly the amount and the concentration of solutes within your blood, as well as do you have these bare receptor influence again to always knowing what the circulation volume is. So I argue that your brain even as you sit here, it's the most reliable real-time calculator of fluid homeostasis at rest and during exercise. It's always got the input. It's going to be so much faster than your iPhone. You keep putting in, oh, the temperature's change. Oh, I'm going a little faster. Oh, I'm a little bit bobbing now. It's always going to be ahead of that. You just have to listen to it. So what are some of, okay, so those are the main stimulus to ABC. What are some of the other stimuluses? When your body really wants the water? Again, when you're vomiting, when you're nauseous, you want water. ABP is going to be high. Hypovolemia, like we talked about, you don't have blood circulating. ABP is going to be high. I don't want to lose any water. Hypoglycemic. ABP is also a stress hormone. So uh, if you have hypoglycemia, it's going to actually activate the stress response. Uh, hypotension in relationship to hypovolemia. There's some interesting um, data that says that cytokines, such as IL-6, inflammatory cytokines may stimulate AVP as well. There's some data from the animals that say that AVP in your brain will help uh, lower body temperature, the, some of the fever. And there's a, even some data out there that says AVP is good at reducing pain. If you think about exercising, if you're going to actually run 100 miles in 30, 30 hours, you're going to have some pain, right? It might be something with that. It may be appropriate. These may be other stimuli. So how do we know that AVP is secreted during exercise? What's the data? So these, we tested a three runners at the 56-kilometer marathon, and so we saw that from pre to post, sodium went 
went down. So if you think, okay, sodium went down, AVP should go down so that you can release some water to keep your blood sodium at a normal level. AVP was high. But also, the change in plasma volume, there's about a 9% decrease in plasma volume. So we thought, okay, maybe that was the stimulus. So we actually took uh, some of these runners who participated in the ultra marathon. We uh, had them do a VO2 max test. And in our lab, we just increase the speed until they fall off. That's their VO2 max. So after 10 minutes, after 10 minutes of exercise, ADP went way up, 15, pretty big. Uh, again, too, it's very sensitive. And then they ran for 60 minutes at 60% of their VO2 max. This is like nothing for them. This was like no stress. So again, too, well, was this all because of plasma volume change? Because if it wasn't due to osmolality, but again, too, if you think about, you know, what was the AVP the highest? It was in the red, VO2 max, ultra marathon, then the steady state. Well, if we look at the plasma volume, what was the order? Well, it's a VO2 max, steady state, and the ultra marathon. So there had to been something else that stimulated AVP during the exercise. We still don't know what it is. Like all good hogs that like to work together, I had to pick that up. Um, I call them little piggies. But anyway, so. It, I think most of you in this department know that thirst and AVP go hand in hand. You know, what happens is your body says, I need water. So if the osmolality starts to get really, really high, AVP is stimulated so that you retain the water. Well, what about thirst? Behaviorally driven thirst is activated when you need water in the system. Okay, I'm conserving everything I want. I need water in the system. So the physiological uh, stimuli to thirst is again same thing as is AVP. When you get dehydration of the cells, when you have low blood volume, when you have hypotension, and also angiotensin two. Well, lo and behold, if you look at the the uh, the solid lines, these are the stimuli for thirst, and these inhibit thirst. These are the exact same stimuli to arginine and vasopressin. And again, the difference is it's a redundant system, whereas AVP is always stimulated first when you have that concentration going up. It's like, okay, I, I need to conserve water. But if you're still losing water through the system, what happens, the body says, okay, I'm losing water and I need water in the system. Because that's when you get thirsty. That's when you want water inside. So the thing that varies, so the sequence between the stimulus to AVP and thirst it's always in that same sequence. What varies is the individual threshold for who, when do you stimulate ADP and when do you get thirsty. So you all have a different threshold. So the yellow is like males and the green is females. But it all it shows is you know you always have this ADP and thirst, but every the threshold is very individual. And again, too, what is the normal plasma sodium? It's generally well within the range in which thirst is stimulated in most people. So how does AVP mediate hyponatremia? How is it the bad guy? Again, on one hand, you have pure water retention. You take in too much fluid, and you can't pee it out or sweat it out. On the other side, there's solute depletion from sodium loss. It's not like you get rid of all your sodium. We don't got to like sweat uh, salt glands like, like some of the animals do. But it's most of the time what we feel is there's some combination that's happening. You're losing some sodium. Maybe you're putting in too much water. Most of the cases of hyponatremia we think now are mixed. And the unifying factor for either if you're retaining water or you're losing salt is going to be AVP secretion. Again, too, if you have a stimulus, um, and you can't get rid of the water, you're taking too much, you're going to get dilution. But if you have plasma volume contraction from the salt loss and you take in too much water, AVP is going to be secreted and you have ADP. So we classify arginine, vasopressin, and hypernatremia into volemic classification. This is from the hospital literature. So hypervolemia means that you actually take in a lot of salt. You see, actually, we see this in, in uh, athletes. I'm like, oh, I'm going to run this 100-mile race. People at uh, Western States, they do. They, they just like taking so much salt. You take in all the salt, you actually expand your plasma volume, and they get really, really thirsty. So they finish a race like 10 pounds over, and we take the sodium because we're all worried because they gain weight, and they're like within the normal range. And it's because they took in so much salt, and they needed to take in water to balance out that concentration, right? That's hypervolemia. 
eubulimia is actually where we see the dilution, where you're not taking any more sodium, but you're taking in too much water on top of that. They're drinking too much. We have people drinking 100 cups of water in America. That is eubulimia. Your body really doesn't care about the salt because it is taking in too much water. If you're losing salt and that causes your vascular space to shrink, that's called hypovolemia. Okay, so how do we know that hypernatremia comes when you take in too much fluid, even if you take in too much salt and fluid? Well, again, like I told you about, when I first came, I got into this game because of the Houston Marathon, and I draw your attention to this blue line. This is total cup. We asked all of the people who came into the medical camp, how much water did you drink? And marathon runners, we know cups. Like, okay, there's a, there's a, Every mile, there's fluid, so we know how much cups that they drink. So if we look at blue, is total cups of fluid taken in. We look at the x-axis. This is your blood sodium concentration. You can see out here, there was an inverse linear relationship. Those who took in the more water had lower sodium concentrations. And again, too, people were taking 100 cups, 80 cups during the, the marathon because they thought they needed to. They didn't want it to get dehydrated. They also found the same thing at the Boston Marathon, where they looked at over 400 people. They found that the people who had more likely to have hypernatremia is if they gained weight during a marathon. And then also, too, where I was at Kim Noakes in South Africa, then we combined a bunch of races. We looked at over 2,000 athletes. And again, too, using body weight as a circuit, what they found was it was more likely for people to get, develop hypernatremia if they gained weight. But this was not always the case. So that's, the, that's some of the data that suggests that people are taking in too much water and they have dilutional hypertension. People say, well, how do you know that AVP is elevated? How do you know, don't know that it's suppressed? Well, this is data from Art Siegel from people who collapsed in the Boston Marathon. And so all of these people in the medical tent had hypertension. And the, you know, even though some of the people had suppressed AVP, other people did not. Again, too, we did a treatment trial at Western States. And what we found, this is the serum sodium value. We had six people who, well, we had 18 people start, only six people finished. One person took a wrong turn. But we, we said that he finished. He took a wrong turn at like 96 miles. Can you imagine that? So he's like, sorry, don't make it. So anyway, we took these six people. This was their starting blood sodium. This is their finishing non-sodium, went down. Um, this is their AVP, starting AVP, finishing AVP went up. But these are the people who finished the race and they entered another trial. They were hyponatremic at race finish. This was their starting sodium. This was, we gave them hypertonic saline, either oral or IV, and it went up. But if you look at their AVP levels when they came in hyponatremic, it was higher than the people who came in with normal blood sodium. And again, too, even if they, they increased, it was still high. So uh, for me, this tells me that even in hyponatremia, AVP is elevated and it's somehow contributing to their inability to get rid of some of that water to bring that blood sodium concentration back to that, that magic 135 to 135. Okay? So how do we know what's the evidence showing that people lose salt and get hypovolemic hyponatremia? Well, we know that when we sweat, our sweat contains salt. So when we talk about exercise salt losses, we're thinking primarily of sweat sodium losses. So exercise above 40% of your VO2 max, 87% of the sodium is lost through sweat. And even though your sweat that you lose is always hypotonic, so if you think blood is normally 140 milliliters per um, liter, your sweat is somewhere between 7, excuse me, 10 or 70 milli equivalents per Leader. So generally, if you sweat and you took nothing in, your blood sodium should go up. So anyway, anyway, so we lose sodium from sweat. So we get hypovolemic hyponatremia in clinical situations when they have a lot of vomiting and diarrhea, even if they actually sucked out all the gastric juices in the people that actually took away people's sodium and they got hypovolemic hyponatremia. Or in the clinic, people who have high blood pressure, they give them thiazide diuretic, which makes you excrete salt. If you excrete salt and you, that makes you excrete water. But there, there's something about this where, where they're losing sodium and they will get hypovolemic and hyponatremic. So the problem is, how do you tell who is hypovolemic 
and who's not. If you have volume depletion, that's because your body is losing salt from the vascular space, right? Volume depletion. So if you're losing salt, your body says, I, I need to save some of this stuff. I'm losing too much of it. I need to conserve it. So we start looking at urine volume. And again, too, if you're putting way too much water in the system, you don't need to conserve the salt. You need to, to control the water. So what they did in the clinic, this is a beautiful trial. And they looked at people who were hyponatremic. And people, if you were hypovolemic, if you gave them a liter of normal saline, and they responded to that because they got the amount of, correct amount of uh, salt and water, and they were able to adjust, they, these people were hypovolemic. That's how they were able to tell. Anyway, so what they found was the biggest predictor is if you had hypovolemia and you try to conserve the salt because you're losing a little bit more, is if you look at your sodium concentration. If your urine sodium concentration was below 30, that meant that you were conserving as much salt as you possibly can, and you probably have some degree of volume depletion from the losing salt. If your urine sodium concentration is above 30, your body's not really concerned about the salt, it's more concerned about the water. So in terms of detecting, we're starting to use this as a criteria. So how do we think that people, uh, this may be true, people are losing too much sodium through sweat. Well, again, if we looked at 100 mile races, Marty Hoffman did this, and he found that if the midpoint temperature was higher, we seem to have a greater incidence of hyponatremia. When we looked at urine sodium at the end in our hyponatremic trial, what we found is almost all the people who were hyponatremic at the end of this really hot race, all their urine sodiums were below 30. So we said, okay, in that variant, it is probably more from salt depletion the longer, hotter races. And again, too, this is Mary Beth Brown's um, data, and she had cystic fibrosis, who had a really, really salty sweat concentration, salty sweaters, and people who had less uh, salty sweat. And what they found is people who had really salty sweat had a decrease in plasma volume, and this was linearly related. So sustained sweat sodium losses may trigger volume depletion. So hypovolemia above 8% stimulates ADP secretion. This is a similar scenario to that of 5 in and diuretic. Tissue perfusion will be defended over tonicity. You want to maintain that blood so it's going to like retain the water even though you're losing salt. So that if you have AVP and you, uh, that's really, really high and you drink too much, even in this case scenario, you're going to dilute, you're going to get hyponatremia as well. So exercise induced ABP secretion is appropriate during exercise because of other stimuli, maybe temperature or whatever. We still don't figure that out. However, osmotically inappropriate non-suppressed ABP secretion can play a pathogenic role in hypernutrient if fluid intake continues beyond the need, regardless of mechanism. So again, if you still, you know, regardless if you're drinking too much or if you're not, you know, you need the salt and you're still drinking, if you're, you compel yourself to continue drinking because you think you need water, that's when you start to get into problems, either mechanism. So what do we conclude? I think that ADP is the good guy. It's trying to protect tissue perfusion. It's trying to protect osmolality uh, during exercise. I think that our behavior is actually the bad guy in this scenario. So that the physiological mechanisms designed to cope with excess are scarce. So again, too, we're designed to, for scarcity. But when we have now excess, what are, what does our body do to try to get rid of that water? To me, we see a lot of vomiting. That's about it. Um, so until we have enough evolutionary pressure for the next 100 million years, I think we're going to have a lot of problems. Conclusion, I hope you uh, agree with me that hyponatremia is not just like too much water in and salt loss. It's very, very complex. It's a mix of water retention and salt loss. If I had to make a generalized statement, probably in really short distances, uh, if you drink too much water, we see more of a dilutional component in really, really long events hot climates, we probably see more of a volume depletion role. 
um, understanding the spectrum of hyponatremia guides the most appropriate treatment and prevention strategies. So it's important for us to know why, so that we know how to prevent it and how we treat it, because it differs. Future directions, uh, I'm looking at sodium in bone. So this is actually a DEXA scan. And so, you know, people said, well, can you even see sodium? Because about 20 to 40% of the, our bone is made of sodium. So uh, the elongated tablets is like calcium tablets. The round tablets is salt tablets. So we actually gave uh, people salt tablets and I put it next to DEXA. You can see that, you can see the salt in bone. If you were interested in anything that I had to say and you love hypnotremia, there is going to be a conference now in response to the two deaths, the football deaths, and this is going to be in San Diego in February. It's free. Um, 18 of the world's foremost leaders in hypnotremia will be there, so I've given you the link here if you're interested. Again, I'd like to thank uh, the invitation. Um, Joe Revolt has been instrumental in in running my assays and helping me, Tim Noakes, Western States, who's been very supportive, uh, my institution, who's been very supportive, the people that I've worked with who love hyponatremia. Um, you know, I'm starting to get people to work with me in the lab. We have mostly undergrads, so it's interesting that this is this is this is what undergrads do. So I had an undergrad go, yeah, I have to do research with you. So we dragged him to Western States. He said, okay. We need to collect urine. So our subjects, anytime they had to urinate, they urinated in a, like a baggie. We clipped it and then we put it on the side. And then we had people like Ashley Sweet pick up all the urine and put them in. So you can see he had, he came into after 50 miles falling runners, he had a backpack in the back, he had a backpack in the front, he had carried two trash bags of urine. Right. And the grid. So we had great data from that. I hope you have some questions. I hope I didn't get too long. Thank you for your attention. This would suggest if they are participating in longer, hotter, non-acclimatized, that yeah, if it goes on for a long time and hot, that they, they are. So I, I think that, it, that happens. I didn't before, but I do now. Thank you for the talk. It's very informative. I was curious, you mentioned at the very beginning about different animals that sometimes get yep. Mm -hmm. Could you comment a little bit more about that and if you think it's behaviorally related or uh, pathogenic or just whatever reason? Okay. So before I go into the sled dogs and the endurance horses, it's interesting if you look at the camel. I put a camel there for a reason. And what makes the camel, you know, why can they, how are they able to uh, survive these really extreme environments and, and, and actually they looked a lot at their physiology and it was the resistance of their cells to osmotic stress. Their cells are like, we have this really, really hard cover that can actually deal with these changes in tonicity. So when they, you know, they, they lose 42 uh, liters of water and they, they drink it all back in five minutes, it's like their ability for their swells to actually be, uh, be flexible. So going back to the animal models, we see it in long, horses that are participating in really, really long races. Um, and horses, their sweat is isotonic, which ours is hypotonic. So it's interesting, so when they lose sweat, they lose water and salt at the same concentration. But they find that, again, too, it's more like they are losing the salt and they're replacing it mostly with the water. So in those situations, again, it's more like the natural hypovolemic variant where your body's going to say, okay, I need the perfusion. So they're still going to drink because they have that hypovolemic stimulus. And they're going to like, if you're fighting, your body says, I need the tissue perfusion first. Then when they stop, they'll go to the salt lakes and, and things like that so that they will eventually normalize their blood sodium concentration. So that's what they, we find with the uh, horse literature. In the sled dogs, they, uh, in these etiterods, I think they're like a hundred mile races or are longer than that. So what they find was uh, they have a big protein component. So again, they're mostly carnivores. And so when they eat, they're eating a lot of 
of meat and they ha that protein actually has to be excreted from the body. So the protein excretion is bringing a lot of water with that and they're not some so when they're actually they they have to like lose the water because of the protein so they will drink more water again to not fulfilling the salt component so again they feel that that naturally is again trying to protect the perfusion over the tonicity until they stop they're losing the water they're taking the water because they need it because uh, they're losing it but they're not taking in the salt with it and those are the only two animals naturally who do it Uh, can, I, can I ask you to make a comment on this, uh, I would say, trend during the last 5-10 years for people taking a massive amount of sodium during prolonged exercises, mm -hmm. like pills and like all kind of gadgets that they go in the bikes so you can take uh, sodium pills during exercise. Can you make a comment on this? Yeah, so again, so the big question would be, if you take an extra sodium, is it harmful? So there was a case study, I think it was by Lux in, in MSSC. It was a cyclist who took in um, 25, 26 grams of sodium per day. And so what is your, your estimated requirements? Like 1.5, okay? So it was a lot. So what happened is when he, he was going, he was expanding his plasma volume uh, to try to compensate from that. Taking in all the sodium, made him take in all this water, got hypervolemic. When he got into the mountain stages, got pulmonary edema. So I think there... If you take in way too much salt, there are some detriments. And if you go back to the, some of the uh, lab studies in the 1980s, uh, there was anything like with dehydration. If you have an increase in salt, you have a higher uh, body temperature as well, they found that, and the fatigue was, was greater in some of those lab trials. What I don't know um, and I'm curious about is, so I know a lot of um, – Ultra runners taking a tremendous amount of salt. And again, too, so they finish the races like 10 pounds up, but they're normal nature treatment. But what I worry is like they're so used to taking all this salt. If they're put in an environment that's even more stressful, do they need even more salt on top of that because that's their steady state? That I don't understand. So I don't know. I think there is harm for taking more sodium and again too most of, most of it is going to be like you're going to be bloated for about five days but i think you know you can't if you take way in too much you get into the, the mountains you get pulmonary edema but i don't what i don't understand is is again is that your new new level and do you need more i don't know can you help me on to that i think there are some evidence that when you are high sodium diet your acclimatization benefits as far as Spurring sodium from your sweat increases, and there are some old data actually uh, from the 80s that have shown that. So it, it makes sense what you suggest. So if you are used to take massive amount of sodium, and then for whatever reason either you don't have access or the environment is unusual, you could potentially run in a risk. But what I hear is that acutely, as a mean, if you take sodium, you could potentially prevent hyponatremia. Unless you drink too much. Even if you drink too much, that's what you said. Yeah, so again, to people who try to maintain body weight with water, you know, the only way that you can rectify that is if you take in sodium. You became hyperbolemic. So yeah, I think that you can, but again, too, still, people are still drinking way too much. You look at the Montaigne models, the mathematical models, and with a little bit of so. But, correct. I have one more question, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. you um, you mentioned something about thirst, and you saw that very interesting graph by Joe Bervalis mm -hmm. uh, about ABP secretion, plasma osmolality, and urine osmolality, which is which is very interesting, and I totally agree with that. What, what is interesting, though, if you look closely, you see that even below thirst stimulation, urine osmolality is very close to its maximum capacity. So you're very close, weight 900. Hi, I'm J.D. Adams. I'm working on my PhD in exercise science here at the University of Arkansas. Exercise science, simply put, is understanding how to maximize the body's health and performance. I'm interested in the science of heat and hydration in both healthy people and people with medical conditions. Let me show you what students and faculty are studying in the Human Performance Laboratory at the U of A.
Concussions are a serious concern for athletes of all ages. Dr. R.J. Elbin studies the neurocognitive, physical, and psychosocial effects of sport-related concussion in youth and college-age athletes. His research focuses on identifying factors that influence concussion risk and recovery. Whoa, Dr. Michelle Gray does research on functional fitness to help older adults live independently as long as possible. She studies muscular power, an aspect of fitness that gets to the heart of the matter. Maintaining adequate muscular power helps prevent fall injuries, the leading cause of both fatal and non-fatal injuries among older adults. Well, how'd I do? JD, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is you survived the test. The bad news is the worst reading we've ever seen. Man, I need to work on my core strength. Dr. Barry Brown created this device called the ab test to quantify core strength. His research has shown that sit-ups measure abdominal muscle endurance, not strength. Building the core reduces lower back pain and enhances athletic performance. Wow, there's some fascinating stuff in here. Diabetes begins with insulin resistance in the skeletal muscle. Dr. Nicholas Green is researching how we can use exercise to combat those effects. His research is working toward ways we can prevent diabetes and related diseases or lessen their severity. Dr. Tyrone Washington's research focuses on how different physiological conditions, such as obesity and aging, affect muscles' ability to recover from damage. <sighs> Nothing like water to quench your thirst, but too little water can have a big impact on a person's health, exercise performance, and cognitive function. By artificially inducing thirst and monitoring the body's response, Dr. Stavros Kabaris shows that even small degrees of dehydration can also affect kidney function, glucose metabolism, and hormonal changes. Man, this suit is hot, but researchers use it to study body temperature control. Dr. Matthew Ganio's research focus is on understanding how hydration and heat stress affect people with medical conditions such as diabetes and obesity. The findings from this research have implications for how to improve long-term cardiovascular health. Man, it's hot in there. But Dr. Brendan McDermott needs a heat chamber like this to do research on prevention and treatment of exertional heat stroke and hydration status in athletes. His studies can have profound benefits not only for athletes, but also people such as soldiers and those who work in extreme weather conditions. Well, what do you think? Pretty cool stuff, huh? Many of our graduates go on to work in clinical, sport, and academic settings. If any of this interests you, visit our website. You can be a part of the important research going on to help people live healthier lives. We look forward to hearing from you.